Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Ernie McGlisco. And uh, I used to be a swimming coach. So what am I doing here? <laughs> I wonder that often. <laughs> At one time back in the 80s, rowing didn't have any coaching materials. And they adopted a book that I'd written because the training section of the book could be, a, well, really could be adapted to training rowers. And it could be adapted for track and it could be adapted for a variety of other sports because energy metabolism is really time dependent. And so if you know approximately the length of time you're going to be exerting yourself, and in your case that's what, around five to seven minutes, I believe. Uh, that's like training a 400 meter freestyler or a miler in track. You use the same kind of uh, strategies. And so that was, that, that was adopted and I was invited to speak at some of the conferences on rowing. Since then, you've gotten a lot of good books of your own. And uh, they keep inviting me back and I'm retired and I have the time and so I keep coming back. Now, what I... I try, I try to stay current, and um, back in the 80s, the training was all about what the East Germans were doing. And they introduced training zones and uh, the anaerobic threshold theory of training, and, and uh, most of us jumped on it because they were, they were beating everybody. We didn't realize at the time that it wasn't necessarily their training that was doing that. but. Uh, they, we did try to follow what they were doing and it did make sense physiologically. They, they did have some pretty good people <clears throat> working with, with athletes and I've noticed over time that rowing seems to be just a little bit behind swimming in changing from one type of training to another. And a few years back you seemed to be really big on the uh, training zones and the uh, threshold training and and I think you're probably starting to move out of that as uh, we did in swimming and so the purpose of what I'm going to talk about today uh, how many of you know about um, high intensity training that's a hot topic right now and I think that that may take us down the wrong road and I, it's the latest fad, and believe it or not, if you've been, been around as long as I have, and none of you have, um, <laughs> you've seen these fads come and go. When I started in coaching, we were just coming out of the long, slow distance thing. We were all learning from track and field, and they were doing a lot of long, slow distance. And the physiologists were telling us to train at race pace train faster and do interval training. In fact, interval training was invented when I was swimming. That was when we first started doing it. And it started in track and then we picked it up in swimming and other sports. And then that ran its course and we got into what the East Germans were doing with the anaerobic threshold, which was essentially going back to long, slow distance again, making sure you didn't train too fast, too often. And now we're coming out of that phase and we're moving back into the uh, emphasis on pace training and sprint training. And having seen that whole thing go cycle itself, I know that there are values in both types of training. And the problem is that when we move from one to the other, we just throw out the other one. We just say, oh, that's old stuff and we don't do that anymore. And now we're, we've got this new, better way which is really a, an old other way, not a, not a new, better way. And um, so I've been trying to figure out this training thing all my life, and I'll go to my grave still trying to figure it out. And I've got a, a theory of training now that I'm on that I think has some value. Unfortunately, I'm not coaching that. 
How you doing? I'm not coaching, and so I um, don't have a chance to try it out. But it makes sense to me, and it answers a lot of questions with all the other methods that I've tried in training. It makes it answers some of the questions that I had. Why didn't this work, or why didn't that work, or why did I get this result instead of that result? And so this, um, I think, might be on a, uh, a new sort of uh, road. But I want to start out with high-intensity training because, it's, as I said, it's beginning very popular now. What is it? What is the physiology behind it? And what are its strengths and weaknesses? It began with a study by a guy by the name of Tabata from Japan. And what he did is um, he did some high intensity intermittent training and determined the effect of that on both anaerobic capacity and VO2 max, which is uh, the gold standard for aerobic capacity. His moderate intensity group trained six weeks and they worked at approximately 74% of VO2 max training long, slow distance kind of training. The high intensity group did eight 20 second efforts at 170% of VO2 max. And uh, the moderate intensity group improved their VO2 max 10% and the high intensity group improved their VO2 max 14%. And I don't know if the, that was a statistically significant difference. I think for all intents and purposes, it was essentially the, the same amount of improvement. But where this shocked everyone is that work that was at one time considered uh, anaerobic or sprint type training improved a measure of aerobic endurance. It improved VO2 max as much or more so than the traditional training. And then over time, this has gradually picked up steam. It started uh, really with training in uh, clubs and such, and now it's, it's getting into athletics, and it's um, getting to be very popular. But the problem I see is that many people are saying it can replace traditional types of endurance training, and I don't think it can, and that's one of the points I want to make today. Now the uh, high intensity group also improved their anaerobic capacity by 28%. You'd expect that to happen because it was anaerobic type work. But this makes it look like you get the best of both, get, you get the best of everything with high intensity training. You not only improve your endurance, aerobic endurance, you improve your anaerobic endurance, all the good things happen. Again, I'm not so sure of that. Picking up the wrong thing. Um, and the moderate intensity group didn't improve their anaerobic capacity, and we'd expect that to happen as well. And I've, I've sort of explained that already. Okay, so this started me thinking, why were the people in this study able to improve their VO2 max as much or more so than, um, than with traditional training? And I think it's because that um, they actually improved the aerobic capacity of their fast twitch muscle fibers with the high intensity training. And uh, maybe that wasn't being improved as well with moderate intensity training. And I, that started me looking into the literature and trying to find out form some ideas about that and why it might happen, and that's the, the gist of what I want to talk about today. You have uh, actually three types of muscle fibers, and they're genetically different, and that is the slow twitch, the fast twitch, and the, uh, the, the two types of fast twitch, the fast twitch A and the fast twitch X, and I'm going to talk about those and then um, go on from there. You all know about getting muscle fibers. You, you do that with a muscle biopsy, which you take this, this little thing right here. Uh, 
It's got a little guillotine sleeve in it, and it will cut off a piece of muscle tissue, and you use some topical anesthetic, and you make a little slit in the, uh, into the muscle, you insert that little needle in there, and then you push down that sleeve and you cut off a little piece of muscle. And you take that and you freeze it as quickly as you can and then, then you study it. So that's how that started getting, getting the muscle uh, biopsies. And when you do that, uh, we found that athletes had essentially two types of fibers at first, slow twitch and fast twitch. This will be a review for some of you and maybe it'll be new stuff for others. The slow twitch were the reddish fibers because they contain more aerobic enzymes and more things that are involved in uh, transporting oxygen and utilizing oxygen. The fast twitch were the white kind of fibers. They had less of that kind of material, but they had more of the enzymes that allow for very rapid anaerobic metabolism. And then within, um, well, the other designations that you may have heard of, type one and type two, that's, that's Roman numerals for fast and slow. And uh, type one is the slower and type two is the faster. So a lot of times you see that in the literature as well. And um, then within the fast twitch group, they found two subtypes of muscle fibers. That's now increased to about five subtypes. And uh, I'll get to that in a minute too. But of the two types, they found what they called a fast twitch A and a fast twitch B fiber. But now they found also uh, a third kind of fiber, and that's they've named that a fast twitch X fiber. And it seems that humans have the fast twitch A and the fast twitch X, and rats have also this third type of fast twitch fiber, a fast twitch B. And what makes these unusual is they seem to be somewhat genetically determined. So that they do seem to be three types of fibers that all of us are born with in different proportions. And the designation now more frequently is in the fast twitch group to call them either type one or type two A and type two X or fast twitch A and fast twitch X. So here's a, um, this is a muscle fiber and the way this is all done is you take, when you get that little piece of uh, muscle from that guillotine sleeve, you use some chemicals on it. Now first of all, you start off with chemicals that tend to um, be absorbed by aerobic enzymes. And when they're absorbed by these enzymes, they turn dark. And so you can identify the slow twitch fibers by using that, and you see the fibers that turn dark in the sample are the uh, slow twitch. And then you can use some other chemicals that are absorbed mostly by anaerobic enzymes. And on this second time around, you'll see that some other fibers will, will turn dark, and those are the fast twitch X because they have the most anaerobic capacity. And the ones that stay light are the fast twitch A. And then you can count in a certain area and determine by percentage how much of each fiber a person will have. Now, almost all fibers have all th all, all muscles fibers have all three types in them, and uh, it, some fibers are more like the postural muscles are, are more slow twitch, and uh, other fibers are more fast twitch. And usually what we do is we study the muscles that are involved in the performance. With swimmers, that would be the deltoids. With runners, it would be in the muscles in the legs and the calf. And uh, you find different percentages of these in people. Now, their characteristics are that the slow twitch fibers have the most endurance. Their contraction speed is slower, but it's not really slow. You're talking about in milliseconds. And their power is low. And the fast twitch A have a moderate amount of aerobic capacity. 
They're fast contracting, and they have a lot of power. And the fast twitch X have even less aerobic capacity, the least of all. They have the fastest contraction speed, and they have the highest contraction power. And there you see the differences. And at the percent of maximum force from zero to 100% uh, of maximum force, the slow twitch, the green ones, don't peak up very high but they also don't lose their power very rapidly either. The fast twitch A fibers peak up much higher and they also lose it faster and the fast twitch X of all, I have B here because I couldn't change it, uh, the fast twitch X have the highest contraction power and they also lose force more rapidly than any other. And the reason for that is because of the kind of nerve cells. Your body's arranged so that you, you have motor units within a muscle. And a motor unit is a group of muscle fibers, like you see these four right here, and a nerve cell, and a nerve, the axon of the nerve that comes down and embeds in those fibers. Now, all of these fibers are served by this one nerve. And so, if an impulse comes over that nerve, and that impulse is strong enough to cause contraction, all of those fibers will contract. And they'll contract maximally, as hard, as powerfully as they can. All the fibers within a motor unit are of the same type. They'll all be fast twitch, or they'll all be uh, slow twitch, or fast twitch A, or fast twitch X. So within a muscle, you may have all three types of fibers. Within a motor unit, it would be one type of fiber that's served. The fibers that serve the uh, fast twitch are larger, I mean the nerve cells are larger, and they require greater stimulation to contract. These are easily stimulated. These require greater stimulation to contract, but when they contract, they contract higher, but they lose uh, speed and power faster. And then the fast twitch X have the largest nerve cells and they require the greatest stimulation to contract. The fibers are usually larger and they have the highest contraction strength and also lose that, that force faster than any other. Now, uh, just some little facts here and there. People always wonder about this when you start talking. Um, what kind of percentages do you find in the general population? You find uh, most people, uh, there are maybe 15 of you in here, so probably about uh, 10 or 12 of you have approximately 50% fast twitch and 50% slow twitch fibers, whether you're male or female whether you're young or old. It won't change very much. But there's a range of um, fast twitch and slow twitch. And you notice this range with, within women is about 32% to 69%. In men it can be 13% to 98%. So you don't find as many women who have extreme fiber types. That is, you don't find very many women who have 80% fast twitch fibers. But you can find that with men. And so women are not as quite as explosive as men, even the, the female sprinters. And you see that this stays pretty much the same when you're younger. And then the distribution of the fast twitch A and the fast twitch X tends to be about like this. You see it, uh, there are fewer fast twitch X with men and women than there are with girls and boys. So a lot of people think, and that's what you were getting, do these change? Do the X fibers become A fibers? Well, I don't think that happens but I think they become more like the A fibers because these three types of fibers are genetically distinct. 
So I don't, um, a lot of times in the literature people will say, well, the A fiber became an X fiber or vice versa, the X fiber became an A fiber. And I don't think that really happens. What really happens is it becomes more like it. Yeah. In the columns for men and women, the distribution of fast switch A and fast switch X total to the average for fast switch? Excuse me? Well, 32 and 16 at the bottom, yeah. columns to 48, right? Uh huh. But over under boys and girls, the totals to 42 and. You mean the numbers don't add up? Yeah. yeah. I guess they probably just don't add up exactly uh, because we're talking in, in um, percentages and generalities here. And also it may be because it was, this data is from two different studies is why they may not add up. Because what I did is I, I summarized the results of a number of studies. And that's probably what happened. It's very difficult to do this accurately because of um, the problems of identifying each fiber type. Sometimes they look very similar uh, and then counting as well. So it's, and uh, the techniques for doing this have gotten better and better as time has gone on. But some of this is not right, right on the money, I'm sure. Now, uh, what happens here when you see a shift like this is, I don't really believe that the X fiber became an A fiber, it became more like it. Now the difference between the A and the X fiber is the A fiber has more aerobic capacity. It has more aerobic enzymes. It operates more like a slow twitch fiber, although even with training it doesn't get to be as enduring as a slow twitch fiber. And the X fiber becomes more like an A fiber, so that when you type them, when you use these chemicals to type them, what used to be an X fiber may stain darker and appear to be an A, an a fiber. Now, has it changed? Yes, it's taken on the characteristics of an A fiber. Is it a permanent change? Probably not. It's probably not a permanent change. It can be reversed when you uh, detrain. The other question that always comes up is can you take a, a fast twitch fiber and turn it into a slow twitch fiber? And there again, I don't know the answer because the literature's got studies that show that you can and studies that show that it can't be done. Most of the studies that show that it can be done have one or two things that have happened. One, they've surgically implanted a nerve from a fast twitch fiber, I mean from a uh, slow twitch fiber to a fast twitch fiber, and it becomes a slow twitch fiber. The other thing is they've done it with animals, birds, rabbits, cats, and they claim that there's a fiber shift. I don't really think there is. I doubt that you can change a slow twitch to a fast twitch or vice versa. You can make a fast twitch more enduring. So that it operates more like a slow twitch, but I don't think it ever becomes a slow twitch fiber. I don't think it would ever stain quite as dark as a trained slow twitch fiber. And the reason I think that is studies that I've seen with bodybuilders and with weight trainers. You would expect that years and years of training with weights and doing explosive type exercises would cause all of these athletes to have more fast twitch fibers. But they don't. They have about the same kind of pattern that we see here. We, see, we find some, about 50-50 most of them. So I don't really think you can change the fast twitch, the slow twitch, or vice versa. But within the fast twitch group, I think, uh, I think it's pretty certain that you can make the fast twitch X fibers more enduring. Okay, um, with athletes, when they looked at athletes, uh, say an untrained group, 
This is kind of a, an average for that particular study. And you notice here, they put in a, an AX fiber. Now, actually, they're now talking about five different fiber types. They aren't really distinctly different. They're just, uh, in, I think, in different stages of training. A fast twitch AX fiber is one that is moving, uh, I forgot which way it goes. I think it's moving from uh, an A fiber toward an X fiber. It's losing some of its endurance and it's gaining um, speed and force. Then there's also a fast twitch XA fiber. And I think that's one that's moving from its, and that's what generally the, where the movement takes place is it's moving from uh, the characteristics of an X fiber and gaining endurance and becoming more like an A fiber. So now they actually recognize about five different fiber types. And the fast twitch AX and the fast twitch XA are fibers that are in transition and how they can really get that precise with, the, with typing these fibers, I don't know, I've never done it. Just take it on faith that they can. And then um, you see recreational runners and untrained people are pretty much the same. And then you get to the endurance train. And what you would see with endurance train people is more slow twitch fibers and um, very few fast twitch AX fibers and very few fast twitch X fibers. In fact, it says none here. Resistance trained are very much like the untrained. Bodybuilders, again, very similar, probably not statistically different. Plyometric trained people tend to, uh, apparently plyometrics do tend to uh, improve the power and contraction speed of muscles. And then sprint trained, you usually find uh, a greater percentage of fast twitch fibers. Now, is it an advantage to have more of one type of fiber than another? Theoretically, it is, but that advantage can be overcome by lots of other things like uh, skill and training. Yeah? You may have just answered it, but um, so the question I had earlier was that you can't change from slow twitch to fast twitch. Yeah. Extra safe so are these percentages, they were... They already exist in that particular probably, person. Probably they exist in that population and they aren't a result of training. So they're people, they're by natural selection. Okay. So you get into track or you, you, you get into track or you get into a, a, another sport that requires power and uh, you get weeded out if you have too many slow twitch fibers maybe. So what's ideal for rowing? Pardon? What's the ideal Probably the ideal. Ed's, Ed's better at this than I am for rowing. What would you say? In the few studies that have been done on rowers, um, they were showing in elite international rowers who had 85% slow twitch, um, with shifts from uh, the shifts of a, as much as 10% over the course of training year. A year? Over the course of the training year. Wow. Because as Ernie's saying, like a lot of these fibers, uh, a lot of whether something is shifting or changing, in my mind, has always been a little a question of semantics. There is a hard change. You won't change the neural input to the fiber. So depending on how you are classifying the fiber, if you're classifying it by its neural inputs, that can't change. If you're classifying it by a uh, metabolic chain uh, staining, then yeah. They definitely do take on the characteristics, and you could, you know, depending on how you want to use language, call it change. But they see as much as a 10% change in some of those fast twitch A's behaving a whole lot more like slow twitch fibers. Okay. So I've already talked about this, the, the uh, four subcategories of fast twitch. And I've talked about that. Uh, there's a study just one particular one I picked out. Before training and after training, you see the slow twitch fibers are approximately the same or are the same. And from study to study, you tend to see this. But again, there are studies where you don't see that either. You see some fiber <coughs> change. And then uh, the big difference you see is here. 
And I picked this one because it added up. <laughs> <laughs> you see, after training, gain 5% more fast twitch A fibers, lost 5% fast twitch X fibers. Now, did the X change to A? No, I think they became more like A. They, they had endurance trained into them. So, and this is what Excuse kind me? of training? Pardon? What kind of training? Um, well, let's see. Is, is it the hit training? Resistance the... training. Resistance training and uh, heat training. Now, this brings up another important point, and that is when these X fibers become more like A fibers, do they lose some of their force? Do they lose some of their contraction force? Do they lose some of their contraction speed? Probably yes. Does that make you a little less capable of uh, really powerful movements? Probably yes. Does it make you capable of greater endurance? Absolutely. So you may lose. And that's another, another uh, issue that you read about in the literature a lot. What do you lose versus what do you gain? And um, when we're talking about sprint swimmers, for example, we want to be careful of somebody who's training for a 50-meter race that takes about 20 seconds. We want to be careful not to lose too much force and contraction speed from the fast twitch X fibers. They really don't need that endurance, but when we're talking about somebody who's going to swim 100 meters or even 200 meters, then we have to sort of tread the line there to get uh, some, we definitely have to improve the aerobic capacity of the fast twitch fibers. And the easiest ones to improve that are with the fast twitch X, but at the same time not lose too much of their contraction force and speed, or not lose so much that it can't come back some with a taper. Now I'll get to the most important point, and this is the one that really surprised me. But after I thought about it, I thought, why should it have surprised me? It really shouldn't have. Any muscle fiber that's trained will improve its aerobic endurance. No matter whether it's trained for sprints or endurance swimming. And that, really, that was really a surprise when I read, I read uh, some of the studies in the literature. When you think about it, why should it? You take a fast twitch X fiber and you train it with sprints and certainly it'll improve its anaerobic capacity but it'll also improve its aerobic capacity because it had very little to begin with and any kind of training requires that that muscle become more enduring and so it will improve its aerobic capacity and it will become more like a fast twitch A fiber and this I think is this is the crux of uh, this theory that I have about training zones is that any fiber the, the First and probably the major change that you will see in any fiber that you train, no matter how you train it, is an improvement in its endurance. It'll improve in other ways too, but it will also improve in endurance. And that probably explains why Tabata got those results that he got. He got greater VO2 max because he improved the uh, oxygen uptake ability of fast twitch fibers by training at a high intensity. So I think why you see this with Tabata is let's take a hypothetical person here who has 55% slow twitch and 45% fast twitch and of those 30% are fast twitch A and 15% are fast twitch X. In order for this person to have the highest oxygen consumption ability they can possibly have, they not only have to improve the aerobic capacity of these fibers, they have to improve the aerobic capacity of these fibers. And then they're going to have the highest VO2 max. Now high intensity training probably improves the aerobic capacity of these fibers, which with traditional long slow distance hasn't happened in the past because they weren't recruited. And even with the anaerobic threshold, uh, probably weren't recruited to the extent that they should be. And so it doesn't surprise me then that you can improve what we 
generally think of as aerobic endurance with high intensity training. However, can you improve it as well? That's what the studies seem to indicate. You can improve it just as much. I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. And I don't know why I'm having all this trouble. What's the duration of time that these studies are run? And Excuse they me? They look at it, the duration of time. So they look at it six months of training like this, a year of training like that, two years. Is, is there a yeah, point you, in you, which that would go backwards? That's another good question. And it does go backward. That's detraining. And it does go back. Um, let's say, let's say you started out originally with uh, maybe 20% fast twitch X fibers and 25% fast twitch A. With training, then this you might get this what you'd call a switch. You get 5% of your fast twitch X fibers acting more like fast twitch A fibers. With D training, this will tend to move backwards. And I even uh, cite one study in that paper that I have where you actually increase the fast twitch X fibers with D-training, which would indicate that some of these fibers actually lost their aerobic capacity and um, became faster contracting. Now that's the beauty of tapering. If you can get, if you can hit that, that just really nice point where you gain as much aerobic capacity as you can gain, and in doing so, maybe you lost some power. But now with rest, you get back that power without losing a commensurate amount of aerobic capacity. Um, the implications for training rowers is if you want to have the most endurance you can have, you've got to increase the endurance of fast twitch fibers because depending on how many you have, um, what percentage of your fibers are fast twitch, you're going to have a whole anywhere from 50% uh, to down to 20% of your fibers will not be aerobically trained. And now we'll get to the recruitment. This is theoretical also. It has not been proven, but it looks as though this is what happens. It's called the uh, ramp effect of muscle fiber recruitment. And the first fibers to be recruited are slow twitch fibers because they have the smallest nerve cells. And they are, they are stimulated <coughs> by the least amount of work. So they're the first ones to get recruited. At a certain level of intensity, the fast twitch A will rotate in and start to be recruited. And then, finally, the fast twitch X are the last to be recruited. And you have to be working at maximum intensity, generally, to rec recruit those fibers. So now, is, I'm sorry, is the X axis, uh, the Y axis, percent of work is work? Yeah, percent. Okay. okay. And uh, it would be nice to know approximately when these get recruited. And I think we can make a guess at that, based on some research with animals and based on the way um, what we see with humans. Probably the point where the fast twitch A start to come in and get recruited is right around the anaerobic threshold. And work that's done below the anaerobic threshold, it's going to be primarily slow twitch fibers that get recruited. When you get up to about the anaerobic threshold, the reason why you see this big increase in lactic acid at uh, speeds just above beyond the anaerobic threshold is probably because the fast twitch A fibers are being recruited and they're producing more lactic acid. They do this naturally, even if they have endurance. They do this naturally. And then the question is, when do these F fast twitch X fibers come in? And it may require speeds, probably does require speeds, in excess of VO2 max to recruit those. So the way you recruit fibers is the slow twitch are the recruited at the lowest level, at higher levels of intensity, probably in excess of the anaerobic threshold, fast twitch A will be recruited in, not to replace slow twitch fibers, but to help them. 
at an even higher intensity, SPAS Twitch X will be recruited in. Again, not to replace anything, but to help it. And uh, in actuality, this is not by uh, speed. It's by intensity. It's by how hard you're working. For example, if I, if I took a very, very light object like this, and I curled it as fast as I could, it wouldn't be fast twitch fibers rotating in, because it's just too light. Slow twitch fibers are doing the work, and they can contract fast enough to do it. But if I get something really heavy, so heavy that I can hardly move it, and it's moving very slowly, all those fibers are going to be working, even though it's moving slowly, because I have to recruit the fast twitch A in, so it's by intensity. But in most sports, when you go faster, you work at a higher level. And so it's kind of an academic point. We could, we could make a theoretical thing like I just did with light and heavy. But in most sports, uh, when you attempt to go faster, you work harder. And so um, that's the way they're recruited in. Now, if this, if this is true, if this is true, then you can see that some training has to be done faster than anaerobic threshold speed if you want to improve the fast, the aerobic capacity of fast twitch A fibers. And some training has to be done perhaps at VO2 max or even faster speeds if you want to improve the aerobic capacity of fast twitch X fibers. Now there are two ways you can recruit these fibers in. I've represented one of them by intensity. The other is by time. You can also work for such a long period of time that these fibers run out of energy, they run out of glycogen. And even though you're working very slow and you're working at a long, for a long period of time and not at a high intensity, the fast twitch A will have to rotate in to help these because they're running out of energy. And at some point the fast twitch X will have to rotate in to help all of them because they're running out of energy and then it won't be long before you're finished when that happens. So you can do it either by intensity, which is probably the easiest way, or you can do it by time. That may explain why long, slow distance does work. Even though, But is it the best way to do this? Is it the most sure way to do this? I don't think so. I don't think it's the most sure way to do this, and it probably it's also the hardest way. I think the, the sure way to do this is to include work of all three types, work of all three types, work below the threshold level, which is going to improve the aerobic capacity of these fibers tremendously, work at the threshold or higher, which is going to improve the aerobic capacity of the fast twitch A fibers, and work at VO2 max. And so really when you talk about what we call generally sprint work, I think uh, one of the major values of that kind of work is that you're improving the aerobic capacity of these fast twitch X fibers and they're contributing more now to your, to your performance. Somebody asked earlier, do these thresholds change as you train the fiber? As an X becomes more like an A, does it rotate in sooner? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to it. But if it does, then there would come a time when you wouldn't have to work at this level to get to all your fibers. I don't, but I don't know, as I say, I don't know the answer to that question. So traditional endurance training does not engage the fast twitch muscle fibers fully, whereas high intensity training does, and that's probably why Tabata got his results. But does that mean you can substitute high intensity for Low intensity, I don't think so. Now here's an example of a study that was done where they, um, they were doing traditional training and then they just did 12 days of very high intensity training over a 28 day period and they got a 3% improvement. And so this high intensity training is necessary and does work and I think what you're really seeing, since it's a 40 kilometer uh, bike ride, is you're seeing an improvement in the aerobic capacity of fast twitch fibers. And 
I, I decided I wouldn't talk about this because we don't have time about the peak lactates and such. Now here's an example of a mitochondria. There's an untrained fiber, the little black things, those are mitochondria, and there's a trained fiber, and they just, they kind of line up better, they, they, they stretch, they're structured better, and there are more of them. That's probably the biggest change that takes place, and it's going to take place in fast twitch fibers, just like it will take place in slow twitch fibers. When those fibers are asked to work, the question is, how do you work them? Can you, can you get those fibers to rotate in and become aerobically trained by doing a lot of long, slow distance? Probably yes. But is it going to take longer and is it going to be as effective for racing? I think probably no. Um. <laughs> now, this is the last thing I want to talk about. And this is with rats. And whenever I get to rats, there's always somebody in the room who says, I don't think rats and humans are the same. Well, they're, they're right. <laughs> they are, thank God. But um, <laughs> there, there's still a lot of things that we've learned from rats. Not everything that we learned from rats applies to humans, but a lot of things have. A lot of big, big advances in medicine have been as a result of rats. So, um, here's a, a study where they trained the rats with endurance training. They got a 100% increase in mitochondria, a 15% increase in VO2 max, and an increase in running time to exhaustion by of 400%. They also trained a group of rats with sprints. Mitochondria didn't increase. But the VO2 max did. Why? I think it's because they got to the fast twitch fibers. And they didn't see a big in change in the mitochondria because perhaps they weren't getting the kind of changes in the slow twitch that they did with the endurance training. And the changes that they saw in the fast twitch weren't significant enough to make a difference. And they didn't increase their running time to exhaustion. Now, I could cite other studies, and I do in the paper that I wrote, um, but I think this is a pretty good example of why you can't simply substitute traditional endurance training with high intensity training, as a lot of people are trying to do. You can't, I don't think you can do that. I think, I think you have to have high intensity training but you also can't make it a substitute. There's no easy way, in other words. You can't get in there and work for uh, 12 minutes a day and, and be as enduring as you would if you were willing to put in two or three hours a day. Now, uh, here is an example of uh, some studies where they compared low intensity with high intensity training. Here's a six-minute ergometer performance. This, uh, this was international rowers. And uh, let's see, I think there's more to this. Yeah, there it is. This was a kind of a unique study. I don't know how good it really was because it wasn't truly longitudinal. What they did is they looked at the best performances of their rowers over a period of years, and they saw that six-minute ergometer performance improved about 10%. Uh, not the same people, but they were nationally ranked. And VO2 max tended to increase by 12%. At the same time, they increased their low-intensity training uh, over the same time period, which was, was I think, uh, yeah, about 30 years. Um, they, they tended to increase their low intensity training from 30 hours to 50 hours a week, and they decreased the high intensity training. And so that's what bothers me about this move toward high intensity training. I think it's necessary, <coughs> but it can be overdone. And it's probably on the way to being overdone right now from what I hear about the popularity of it. Um, and here's why I think that happens. This is my favorite study. 
and this will be the end. Um, <clears throat> there were two studies that were done, one by a guy named Dudley in 1982, and another guy by uh, a couple of people named Harms and Hickson in 1983. Now they used almost the same protocol in their studies, not quite, they, didn't, they weren't replicating, there were two separate studies, but it's interesting if you compare the results, you see um, how similar they were. Now, in the uh, Dudley study, rats uh, have what they call slow twitch fibers, fast oxidative glycolytic fibers, which are like fast twitch A, and fast glycolytic, which are like fast twitch X. And they would train groups of rats at only one particular intensity so they could compare them. No mixed training. One group trained below the thre anaerobic threshold level, another group trained at the threshold level, another group trained only at VO2 max level, they didn't train as long, but the work was equated, and another group trained at VO2 max plus 16%. You can calculate all this for rats on little treadmills. And uh, <clears throat> they looked at improvement in the enzyme capacity of these various fibers. And you can see what happened with the uh, very slow training. There was hardly any improvement in the aerobic capacity of fast twitch X fibers. Some improvement in the fast twitch A. At threshold training, the improvement in the fast twitch A became greater. And you were getting more improvement at, at this level. But here's where they got the most imp Now, this didn't change much up around VO2 max, probably because most of these fibers were already recruited at a lower speed. But these fibers, it, tends, it appears that maybe to really fully recruit them, you've got to get up there to really high speeds. And then if you look here, the improvement in the aerobic uh, enzymes, at, in excess of VO2 max, tremendous improvement. <clears throat> And then if you look at their running time to exhaustion, this seems to, to uh, substantiate high intensity training. Because look at how much longer they were able to run, the groups that worked at higher intensity. But I want to show you one more thing. Look what happened here with the aerobic capacity of the slow twitch fibers. There's a possibility that too much work up at these high levels can actually decrease the aerobic capacity of slow twitch fibers. Uh, if, that's, if what happens with rats happens with humans, there's a good possibility of that. And so to substitute traditional training with high intensity training, you certainly will get big, big improvements here. But you may lose something here. And that's why I think you need both types of training. You need not only the high intensity, you need the low intensity too. And the more slow twitch fibers you have, of course, the more, the more low intensity training you have to do. Because those are the ones that you want to uh, get to, the ones that you want to recruit. Okay, any questions? Yeah. So I, I saw you have one of the Siler papers uh, listed in there, and it seems to me he, he's sort of a big proponent of staying away from threshold, anaerobic threshold training. He likes a lot of his stuff seems to indicate you want to go either very slow or very fast. Could you speak to that? Do you think that's the correct model? Or? Uh, well, I, I don't think that would be no, because uh, what I'm going to get at in the next talk is that in order to get to the fast twitch X fibers, you've got to work up in this level, right up in here. You aren't going to be able to work there very long. Right. Because even though you're improving their aerobic capacity, they are doing a lot of work anaerobically. That's just right. the way it is. It's that, it's that hard. And so they're going to exhaust themselves quickly. And uh, if you're working only really fast or slower, I don't know what's going to happen with this group right here. Because you aren't going to be able to work them as long up in here as you could down in here. 
And so I'm wondering if maybe this particular group of fibers uh, might not get the training effect that they could. So now, you would still be an advocate of some yeah, threshold but, uh, level. I have to put a qualification there. If the recruitment pattern changes as the fiber characteristic changes, in other words, if as if when fast twitch X fibers start to act more like fast twitch A fibers, are they recruited at lower levels of intensity? If that's the case, yeah. It could work, it could work fine. But if not, I don't know that. So to play it safe, I think you want to include all, all three types of training here. I don't think there's any need to train at threshold any longer. That belief that training at threshold really improves endurance better than anything else, I don't think happens. I think you have to train around the threshold. You have to train below, close to, and above. But you don't have to train. You're trying right to find anymore. that threshold point anymore. Yeah, I don't think it's necessary. Okay. Which makes means that all that blood testing and stuff like and then do you, just a quick one and I'll let somebody else jump in, the aerobic threshold, do you describe that as sort of two millimolar, yeah. stop burning fast, start burning yeah. carbohydrate kind yeah. of And so, uh, in the next talk, of, that's, I'm going to go into that, what, how, how you can use heart rate to make your judgments and other things. And if you understand that you don't have to be this precise anymore, that was the thing that really was getting to us is this precision. If we couldn't blood test and know exactly where that threshold was, then we couldn't train him. I don't believe that. That was ever, ever true. And I was a big proponent of that back in the 80s. I don't think it was ever true. It's not necessary. And it means that anybody can use this kind of information for training and do it adequately uh, without blood testing and all that fancy stuff without having doctors. Yeah. When uh, you talk a little bit about detraining, do all the muscle groups or the fibers detrain? Say for tapering. Yeah. Are you going to see the same amount of detraining over all the groups, basically? So. Yeah. As you, as you reduce, yeah. And uh, I can't give you any specifics. I I know there's one book where they try to give you specifics. They they think that the fast twitch fibers detrain much more rapidly than the slow twitch. Um, but I, I'm not sure. The one thing we do know with tapering though is that for sure now you have to maintain some intensity during a taper to keep those fast twitch fibers from detraining. Not as much as you did earlier, but some enough to maintain. And I think that's probably true of the of the endurance work too. You have to maintain a reasonable amount of intensity or you lose that. And I've got some stuff in those papers about uh, about detraining that uh, you probably probably be on that topic. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> okay, I think I'm out of time. Thank you.